Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the James Julia Auction House, taking a look at some of the guns that they are going to be selling in their upcoming Spring of 2018 Firearms Auction. Today we have another cool example of Confederate arms manufactured during the Civil War. I find all these stories really interesting, because the Confederacy really had to struggle to manufacture its own small arms, having lacked a lot of the basic industry that the North had the Union had during the Civil War. Now, what we have here specifically is an S.C. Robinson uh, copy of the Sharps carbine. The Confederacy, one of the things that they were in particular need of armament for was the cavalry. Uh, early in the war these guys didn't have enough carbines, and so you'd see cavalry with pistols. Uh, this is also, by the way, one of the reasons that the Confederacy was trying to manufacture pistols, was not so that they could have guys running around with a rifle and a pistol, but so that they could arm cavalry. Pistols made a, a great weapon for cavalry at this time, because you got multiple shots without having to try and reload um, a black powder rifle or black powder carbine while on a horse. Anyway, uh, they decided to try and copy the Sharps carbine, because, well, it was one of the best breech-loading carbines out there. It was still a black powder firearm, and it used a paper cartridge, so uh, a basically a wrapped paper package that contained the bullet at the front and the powder charge at the back. You'd stuff that into the action, uh, put a percussion cap on, and that took the place of your primer, and presto, you have a firearm. The story of where this particular version of the Sharps came from is based on two different players. We have a Colonel Burton, who worked for Confederate Ordnance, and we have a guy named Samuel Robinson, who was actually originally a Connecticut industrialist, but he had uh, substantial property and business ties to Virginia, and allied himself with the Confederacy when the war broke out. Now, he was an industrialist, <coughs> he knew his way around a factory, and he was definitely interested in making money. And pretty quickly after the war began, he got a contract to convert flintlock muskets into percussion muskets for the Confederate military, uh, and did quite a large business of that, something like $75,000 worth over the course of a couple years in the early part of the war. That was a lot of money back then. So he was a known product, and he did good work. Um, at the same time, Burton was trying to set up machinery to make firearms for the cavalry. So he was doing, you know, doing several projects simultaneously. He actually worked on setting up revolver tooling with Robinson. Uh, they ended up, that was successful, but they ended up not, Robinson ended up not producing it himself. Instead, uh, he sold all of that machinery and production infrastructure to Spiller and Burr, who would use it to manufacture revolvers of that name for the Confederacy. Now, Burton worked with a group of other industrialists, including a guy named McNeil, to try and set up production of the Sharps. Those guys seemed good to go, they got the money, and then they weren't actually able to deliver. And so Burton, looking around for a way to salvage this product project, got in touch with Robinson, whom he knew both from their revolver work and from Robinson's work converting uh, flintlocks to percussion. So he knew Robinson was a, a reliable character, and the two of them got together. Robinson, in December of 1862, founded the Robinson Arms Manufactory in Richmond, Virginia, and started producing Sharps carbines, and actually was pretty good at it. Uh, at the peak of their production, uh, he was making something like 500 a month, in total, over a course of about 13 months, uh, well, December of 62 until March of 63, he manufactured about 1,900 of these carbines, and they were pretty good quality. Um, not as good as a pre-war actual Sharps, but not bad either. So there are a couple little differences between this and a regular Sharps, so let me show you those. Probably the easiest way to identify a Robinson Sharps copy is, well, by the name Robinson, right there on the lock plate. So SC Robinson uh, Arms Manufactory, Richmond, VA, 1862. There is then a serial number on the back of the lock plate. This one's pretty hard to read, but it's 960, so it's right about in the middle of production. Wisely, I think, uh, Robinson and the Confederacy eschewed the idea of a really complex long-range sight, knowing that if you're if you've got cavalry shooting this thing from horseback, they're not going to be shooting particularly great distances, so they fitted them out with fixed rear sights, and of course a, a plain simple front sight to go with it. These carbines were manufactured with sling bars and rings. This is for a single point sling to allow the gun to hang at your side. Uh, you can just drop it if you have to, to deal with the horse and not lose the gun. This was a, a pretty typical uh, 
system for cavalry on both sides of the war, and US cavalry after the war. Original Sharps carbines were actually designed to use Maynard tape primers. So that's basically a long strip of paper with little pellets of primer compound uh, at regular intervals. And on the original carbines you had a little uh, wheel mechanism that every time you cocked the hammer it would advance the tape primer up. And in theory this was a good system for cavalry carbines, because it meant that a cavalryman didn't have to deal with trying to place individual uh, loose primers on that little percussion nipple, which of course would be difficult when you're getting bounced around on a horse. However, the South didn't have the infrastructure to be manufacturing and supplying uh, primer tape, and so they basically eliminated that from the gun, and instead went with just a percussion nipple on the breech block, which you would manually prime with a standard uh, copper cap primer. Operation of the sharps is really quite simple. Uh, you have a little safety lever down here that you can engage to prevent the lever from opening. As long as that's disengaged, pulling down the lever drops the breech block. You would then insert a paper cartridge, and when you close the breech block it would actually shear off the back of the paper cartridge, which exposes the base of the powder charge, put on a cap, fi uh, cock the hammer all the way, fire it, and of course it fires. Now, um, there are a couple issues with these guns. One of them is sealing the breech. This is not usually, this isn't a, a really good system for getting a gas tight seal. There were a couple ways that they tried to fix that. Um, there's a moving primer ring in the back, which you can sort of see there, uh, which in theory gets pressed back into the breech block when the pressure, uh, when you have pressure from firing, and that would seal the gun. When they got dirty, that didn't tend to work all that well, and that's true of both the Confederate guns and the, the proper original uh, black powder or paper cartridge sharps rifles. There was also an interesting issue that if you had misfires, which happened periodically, especially if you didn't keep the flash hole clean, when you opened the cartridge, or when you opened the breech block to try and deal with the, the malfunction, to you know, push the, the projectile out, you'd get a little bit of powder that would dribble down into the bottom here. And that would actually accumulate in the little gap right at the bottom of the breech block where it kind of goes into the handguard here. And over time you could get powder accumulating there, and then at some point <coughs> flash over from firing without a perfect gas seal could come down through this crack and ignite that built up powder, which would cause the forend to, well, explode, and throw wood splinters into the shooter's hand or arm. This was often reported as the gun blowing up, for obvious reasons. It would certainly seem like it was exploding, although that's not actually a, a mechanical problem with the, the barrel. It was loose powder down here causing a separate issue. So that was something that was recorded with these guns. But in general, Robinson's Sharps carbines were really pretty darn good guns. Should you want to disassemble one, it's a pretty easy process. You push in this button and rotate this lever around. And then this is a pin, which can be removed, like so. And then the breech block slides out the bottom of the gun. So you have a little toggle link right there, which is what causes it to slide up and down when you move the lever. Uh, there is the, the, the other end of the flash hole. So you have a primer there, or a, a percussion cap there, and the fire from it comes straight through into here to ignite the powder charge in the barrel. Uh, I, I think I forgot to mention these are 52 caliber, all of them. Um, and that is about it. After the war, Sharps rifles were often converted to use metallic cartridges, but that's not something that would have really happened to the Confederate ones, um, certainly not something that would have been done during the war. And one last thing to point out, we don't have any records of who this carbine was actually issued to, but at some point someone carved their initials into the stock, LSK, and if you look closely below, it's a little hard to see, there's also the word mobile. So um, that could have been the, the actual trooper who carried it, but can't prove it. The reason that production of these ended in March of 1863, which seems rather early, the Confederacy certainly still needed guns at that point, was in fact because the Confederacy needed guns badly enough that they decided to buy out the Robinson Arms Manufactory, and it was turned into a government-run operation in March of 63. They would continue making these guns for the remainder of the war. They weren't quite as efficient at it as Robinson had been, but they still produced another 3,500 or so of these guns, um, mostly indistinguishable from the Robinson ones, except that 
uh, where the lock plate on Robinson's guns is marked with his name. The, con the, the guns made under CSA ownership uh, have basically just a blank lock plate with a serial number. So uh, this is, I think, another interesting and cool example of arms made under duress by the Confederacy. If you'd like to add it to your own collection, take a look at the link in the description text below. That will take you to Julia's catalog page on this carbine, where you can take a look at their pictures, provenance, description, value estimate, all that good stuff. And if you're interested, you can either place a bid online or come down to up to Maine and participate in the auction live. Thanks for watching.